1919, 1919, a noted conservative economist, Joseph Schumpeter, whose work I've read extensively, incidentally, Schumpeter wrote this about ancient Rome. Excuse me. <clears throat> that policy which pretends to aspire to peace but unerringly generates war, the policy of continual preparation for war, the policy of meddlesome interventionism, there was no corner of the known world where some interest was not alleged to be in danger or under actual attack. If the interests were not Roman, they were those of Rome's allies. And if Rome had no allies, then allies would be invented. When it was utterly impossible to contrive such an interest, why then it was the national honor that had been insulted. The fight was always invested with an aura of legality. Rome was always being attacked by evil-minded neighbors, always fighting for a breathing space. The whole world was pervaded by a host of enemies, and it was manifestly Rome's duty to guard against their indubitably aggressive designs. They were enemies who only waited to fall on the Roman people. Does that sound familiar to you at all? We hear today that we don't have one enemy. We have many now. The world communism has been defeated, but now we have many different enemies. They're all around, ready to pounce on us. And unless we keep those extortionary military budgets going, unless we keep being everywhere, all the place, our people will not be safe. They're out there ready to pounce upon us. Why aren't they ready to pounce upon Denmark, say? I mean, why, doesn't, why doesn't Denmark have a world empire? What about little, weak, helpless, sweet Luxembourg? Wouldn't they want to pounce on Luxembourg? Why would they want to pounce on us? Well, I maintain that that's just, that's just the mass line to cover the class line. I gave you what the class line was a little while ago. Yugoslavia, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, was built on an idea, as Ramsey Clark said. Very few countries are actually built on an idea. The idea was that the southern Slavs would not remain weak, divided people falling out among themselves or falling prey to some imperialist outsider. That they would join together and they would have a territory that was large enough and strong enough to become a viable nation with its own development. And sure enough, after World War II, multi-ethnic socialist Yugoslavia was a post-war industrial power, a viable nation, and an economic success. Between 1960 and 1980, it had one of the most vigorous growth rates, a decent standard of living, free medical care and education, guaranteed right to a job, one month free vacation with pay. Oh, when was the last time I had a month vacation? Oh, I can't remember. Affordable public transportation, housing, and utilities. Literacy rate over 90%. Life expectancy was 72 years. Most of the economy was in the public, not-for-profit sector. Now, such a country is a kind that global capitalism normally would not tolerate. Still, Yugoslavia was allowed to exist for some 45 years because it was seen as a buffer to the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact nations. At the same time, efforts were made to undermine the socialistic features of Yugoslavia's economy. Yugoslavia opened us up, up to Western capital penetration as early as the late 60s, early 70s, I, I think it was. I think they made the same mistake that the Polish Communist Party leaders made. They said, well, what we're going to do is continual basic industry building up the industrial base, heavy industry, and we're also going to increase and improve consumer production. Now, how are we ever going to be able to do both of those things, you see? Um, very simply, we got the answer. We'll borrow from the West. Well, once they started borrowing, with borrowing from the West came IMF penetration and an enormous debt. With debt came IMF demands for restructuring. Restructuring is a euphemism for a harsh austerity program. You cut back in public sector spending. You cut wages. You cut, un you cut employment. Uh, you abolish worker management enterprises. In other words, you force your people to work harder for less, producing more, consuming less, and with that difference, you pay off your debt schedule or at least the interest that's accumulating on this wealth.
Still, much of the economy was public sector and not for profit, including the very rich reserves of minerals and, and other natural resources in uh, the province of Kosovo and elsewhere. Then came another blow. What I'm saying to you is that there was a conscious and deliberate plan to fragment and break up Yugoslavia. The other blow was in November of 1990 when President George Bush went to the US Congress and pressured them to pass the foreign appropriations law that called for the cutting off of all aid and credits to Yugoslavia. Trading without credits can be a disaster, especially for a country that doesn't have a hard currency. And this, this had a devastating effect on the country. <clears throat> The law also demanded that if any republic in Yugoslavia wanted further U.S. aid, it would have to break away from Yugoslavia and declare its independence. Okay, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's not my speculation. It's not my analysis. It's a public law. It's a public law. November 1990, the 1991 Foreign Appropriations Act. It's written right there. Go look at it. It required the U.S. State Department approval of election procedures and results in every one of the republics. It required that the republics do not hold national elections, but hold elections only in their own republics, and that the aid would go to individually to those republics. And when the aid did go, it went to those groups which the U.S. defined as democratic groups, which meant small right-wing ultra-nationalists and even fascistic parties. The ultimate goal was to break up Yugoslavia into a weak and helpless cluster of right-wing banana republics, privatized, deindustrialized. The U.S. decided to destroy, with the other Western powers decided to destroy Yugoslavia in 1989, <clears throat> when it became evident that it was the one country in East, Eastern Europe that would not voluntarily overthrow what remained of its socialist system. It was the one country that was still trying for some kind of economic independence outside of the world global free market third worldization process. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose rich natural resources would be at the disposal of multinational corporations, whose populations would work at subsistence wages, whose economy offered no competition with existing capitalist producers, only new investment opportunities. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose petroleum, engineering, mining, and automotive industries would be undone and deindustrialized. And they wanted to abolish Yugoslavia's public sector services and social programs. Now, why would U.S. policymakers, you really think U.S. policymakers are motivated by some need to abolish the social programs, the public sector services, and Yugoslavia? Why would they want to do that? Do you think they are such uh, nefarious, evil, intended individuals? They would want to abolish their social programs? Come on, Parenti. Are you being paranoid? Well, why would they want to abolish our social programs? <laughs> As they have been doing? Aid to families with dependent children, privatizing social security, that's what that president in, the, in Washington is doing. At least a third of it, he's gonna chunk it off and privatize it right under your noses while saying he's saving and serving social security, public health services, public education, environmental regulation, as inadequate at all, as all of these things have been, being cut back, cut back, cut back, library services, oh, we used to have that service, sorry, we don't have enough funds anymore. Not enough funds because we've got to build those missiles, you see. It's the third worldization of Yugoslavia, and it's the third worldization of the USA, and it's the third worldizations of everywhere. That's what the people in column A want. They want a nation that's run by about 50 multi-billionaires, and the rest of us will be 260 million peasants working from hand to mouth for them. Another goal behind the dismemberment of Yugoslavia is to achieve ideological monopoly. Last year, in Serbian Bosnia, the last remaining radio station was a Serbian station. It was a dissident station. It was critical of NATO, critical of Western policy. It was the last station in all of Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
and the article in the New York Times to see the reporter committing these mental gymnastics to explain why the NATO peacekeepers, i.e. Gestapo troops, went in and closed the station down, why that was a step toward more pluralistic democracy. That this was a, it was a marvelous thing to watch him do these gyrations, you know, down this column. Yugoslavia, before the NATO bombings, before this war began, before that, in Yugoslavia, every opposition newspaper, uh, every opposition political party had its own newspaper, its own radio station, and there were over 20 of them. Milosevic today, <clears throat> Milosevic today uh, uh, has more opposition parties in his parliament than any other leader in Europe. Of course, since the NATO bombings, they've shut down all the newspapers, they've shut down their radio stations, as we had happened in this country with German stations and, and things like that in World War I, if you remember, and we weren't even being bombed or attacked. Milosevic has been elected president three times, twice of the Republic of Serbia, once of the, of the Yugoslav Republic, or what's left of it now, in elections which foreign observers said were pretty much okay and legitimate. Yet he is called a dictator. He is called, he is called a war criminal. The Hague War Crimes Tribunal has asked the United States for documentation of the war crimes that he has committed so that they, might in, they may indict him as a war criminal. So far, it's been over a year. No documentation has been forthcoming. Will you please tell me Noam Chomsky called him the monstrous Milosevic, giving no specifics. Could someone start giving me some specifics about it? The Yugoslav, the U Yugoslavia has another problem on this ideological monopoly. Its TV station is state-owned and is run by people who do not see the world the way the U.S. State Department and the U.S. National Security State does. The Yugoslav TV journalist Novenka Jovicic uh, told me, if I pronounce her last name right, I remember, she asked, she told me when I met her in, in Greece, this was in, at a conference, um, she told me that she asked the U.S. ambassador, what do you want from us? This was last year before the bombings. And he said, we want your television system. Give us that. The U.S. imperialists want an ideological monopoly of all the world's media. And they've got something close to that already. In 1992, another blow was delivered against what remained of Yugoslavia international sanctions led by the U.S. A freeze was imposed on all trade with Yugoslavia. The results brought utter economic disaster, hyperinflation, mass unemployment up to 70 percent, malnourishment, the collapse of the health care system at great cost to the population. By the way, sanctions, as the sanctions in Iraq demonstrate so horribly, civilian, the civilian population is not, does not suffer collateral damage or incidental spin-off from sanctions. The civilian population is the primary target of sanctions. That who's, that's who's being targeted. To justify this violent intervention to the U.S. public, there's been an unrelenting demonization of the Serbian people for the better part of a decade. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Charles Boyd, former, listen to his credentials, former deputy commander of the U.S. European Command. Listen to where he wrote in Foreign Affairs, the establishment journal, the establishment foreign policy journal in the U.S. In Foreign Affairs, September, October, 94, Boyd says, the popular image of this war in Bosnia is one of unrelenting Serbian expansion. In fact, what the Croatians call the occupied territories is land which the Serbs have held for more than three centuries. Most of the same is true of Serb land in Bosnia. In, in short, the Serbs are trying to hold on to their own. The U.S. has punished one side in this war and unfairly, Boyd says. It has supported the legitimacy of a leadership in the Bosnian Muslim government that has become increasingly ethnocentric in its makeup, single party in its rule, and manipulative in its diplomacy. We say we want peace, but we have encouraged a deepening of the war. Why were the Serbs targeted for demonization? By the way, at first they weren't. The U.S. was sort of backing the Serbs, and they got a guy, they pulled a guy up 
who they decided would be their man in the breaking up of Yugoslavia. He was a, a, he was a banker and he was a Serbian nationalist and his commitment to communism was very, very fuzzy or vague. And he was the ideal guy, they thought. And they called him a charismatic personality. His name was Milosevic. And he was our guy. But when they discovered that instead of being a tool, he would be an obstacle, then, of course, he became demonized. The Serbs are the largest nationality, and they're the one most opposed to the breakup of the Federation. But what about all the atrocities they've committed? Well, atrocities and executions have been committed on all three sides. You know, it really was fascinating. Someone's got to do a media analysis of this. In 95, when Clinton was thinking of going in to Bosnia, the atrocity stories about the Serbs started piping up. I'll talk about some of them later in a minute. When he decided, as the 96 election started getting closer, when he decided it might be too messy and, and might, we shouldn't go in, the atrocity stories slowed down, and then the media started. There was a frame of about, maybe about a month or a couple of months there, a frame where they started saying, the Serbs are not the only ones committing atrocities, and they started quoting Croatian and Muslim atrocities and this sort of thing. It was amazing. Then when he decided after 96 that he was going to go in again, then the Serb atrocity stories came up again. It's, it's sort of like the gas flame on your stove, the way the media will follow policy. And there's no, there's no hidden mystery about it. There's no conspiracy about it. They wait to what's fed out to them. If the Pentagon or the, uh, or, the, or the U.S. or the White House says, this is terrible, this is terrible. We've got to go do this. They've got to go do this. U.S. are concerned. We've got to go do that. They are the stenographers of power, you see. 